Hey guys, thanks for checking out this third episode of kind of a series I'm doing on going through Ruben Strayer's How to Think Like an Emergency Physician. I'm hoping you guys are finding some, at least some tips and tricks in here that you can apply to your practice, and maybe it's just clarifying some of the methods that you're already employing in your practice. But either way, I hope it's super helpful to you guys. I think it's really good content. Today we're gonna cover Ruben Strayer's system of how to be effective in emergency medicine. And if you remember the two main roles that we have under the, the main umbrella of what we do in emergency medicine is resuscitation and identifying dangerous conditions. And under your initial assessment of a patient when you're determining if they need resuscitation, you're looking at their vital signs, or do they have altered mental status, do they have any major neuro deficits, do they look sick, and are they a threat to themselves or others? All those patients usually need to be prioritized to a resuscitation bay, or you need to move immediately to that interventions wheel and start intervening. And especially with the suicidal patients, you know, they need to be watched immediately because that can also be a life-threatening condition, especially if they're debating acting on it. So in the hospital setting, we prioritize these patients to go to, you know, our secured unit. We don't just let them sit in the waiting room with everybody else. And so even that's kind of a patient that fits under that resuscitation umbrella. And also under that resuscitation criteria, you know, that's calling ahead to the hospital to get a resuscitation bay ready. Is this patient gonna to need to be intubated? Are you intubating the patient? You need to communicate effectively to the hospital what the room placement needs to be for this patient so it's not a big shock when you arrive. You don't wanna undersell a very sick patient if you think they're gonna need the resources of a resuscitation bay. And we do the same thing in the front of the hospital and in intake. You know, We're prioritizing every patient as fast as we can, mainly so we can get to those patients that might require resuscitation that are coming in through the front doors. All the other patients though fall under the identified dangerous conditions umbrella. And most providers have a particular method that they use to kind of do this. And I have a similar method to Dr. Strayer's. So before I even go and see the patient a lot of times, unless they're critical, I'm reading through prior visits, I'm reading the nursing notes, I'm reading the intake notes. Um, if it's pertinent, you know, I'm reading the EMS run sheet and doing all this kind of prep work before I actually see the patient, see what they've been here before in the past, see what their medical problems are, see what medications we know that they're already on, and kind of using that as my guide before I go and see the patient. I'm also reading the nursing notes. A lot of times the nurse gets in there and gets a story before I do. The intake provider a lot of times has gotten a story. The EMS providers have gotten a story. And I like to read that entire HPI to understand what they told the other people they were here for. So when I go in, I can kind of make sure the story is consistent and make sure that I know exactly why they're here. Dr. Strayer also starts with a little bit of a different tact kind of with patients. Before he asks them what they're here for, he takes one to two minutes at most and he asks, what medical history are you known for? And you know, the patient's really eager to say what they're here for, but when you redirect them a couple times to talk about their history, a lot of times it goes quicker and then you can get through all that a little bit faster. So, you know, what, what medical history are you known for? What medications are you on? And another thing he asks is, what medication changes have you had recently? A lot of times that's a big point that gets missed in your history taking that can be very pertinent. Another big thing is just medication non-compliance. Have you been taking all your medications like you're supposed to? Um, and with these changes in medications, do you know what they are? And are you compliant with those changes as well? And I've talked a little bit about this point before, but the social history is really important, especially when we're considering disposition. Who do you live with? Where did you come into the ER from? Did you drive yourself? Did you come in by ambulance? Those are really important details that just take a couple seconds to obtain, but are really pertinent to our disposition. And then after obtaining all that, he moves on to why the patient's here. And he asks it the same way. He says, what brought you into the ER this fine evening? And a lot of times it's for a complaint that's been going on a while. So it's, it's good to ask, well, what, is worse about this today? What made you decide that today's the day you're coming into the ER for this complaint? And a lot of times that prompts the patient to really specify what's going on today that's different than their, their chronic complaint. And at this point, you probably have a, a good list of differentials. You've read the nursing notes, you know their history, you've seen why they've been here before, you've looked at discharge summaries, 
and you have kind of an HPI from the patient. So you should have a pretty good list of differentials and you can move into the review of systems where you're starting to weed through all those differentials and kind of narrow down the list a little bit. So you're asking, are you having abdominal pain? Are you having vomiting, diarrhea, chest pain, shortness of breath? And you go through all the things that the patient hasn't already told you. And these really just need to be yes and no questions and can require a little bit of redirection on your part if the patient wants to kind of further expand on some of these symptoms. You really just need to know yes or no, are you having these associated symptoms? Another question he talks about that I've started to incorporate more recently is, have you ever had these symptoms before? Because a lot of times the patient won't volunteer that information and it's a pretty high yield question. I mean, if they have had these symptoms before, what's been the outcome? What's been the diagnosis? Have they ever figured it out before? Um, it can really give you a lot of beneficial information. So I've started to ask that a lot more and I feel like it's very helpful. And then you move on to your physical exam and that's where you kind of try to narrow down that differential list a little bit more. If you're worried about appendicitis based on their history but they don't have any abdominal tenderness, you can kind of weed that one out. And you do a focused physical exam based on these differentials that you have left. And then finally you make a plan. You know, what differentials have you not been able to rule out based on the HPI, the review of systems, the physical exam? What test do you need to order to narrow that list down further? And part of your plan is while you're ordering these tests, you need to make a plan for the results of these tests. And usually that just means planning for all negative results. That's a lot of times what we get is all completely negative results. The imaging's normal, x-rays, CTs are normal, the lab work's normal. What do you do if everything's normal? Does this patient still need to stay in the hospital for further testing that we can't do in the ER? Do they have a really high risk story and you don't wanna send them home even with normal results? Because usually if there's a positive result, that's gonna dictate what you're gonna do. If you have a positive troponin, this patient's staying in the hospital and needs to see cardiology if you think it's from a STEMI or an NSTEMI. Or you know, positive imaging findings like appendicitis or a small bowel obstruction, they're gonna need to see general surgery. So it's really easy to decide what to do with positive results, but you need to have that plan in the back of your mind for all negative results. You know, If everything's negative, is this patient gonna go home? Because a lot of times that's not the right answer. They might need further testing that we can't do, or they might might need an observation period or some treatment for their symptoms. So have that plan in the back of your mind for negative results so when they pop up, you can create a disposition. The next part that he talks about is really pertinent just for those of us that work in the ER as providers. And it's called running your board. So when we have our whole list of patients, you know, in between seeing each new patient, we come back to the computer and you're supposed to run your board. And that's clicking on every patient and kind of determining where they're at in their ER visit. And you ask yourself some questions while you're running the board. Is the patient getting better or getting worse? What else are we waiting on in this disposition? Should I go in and offer the patient food, an update, some pain medications? And then you update your charting while you're doing that as well. And it's a good habit to go and run the board every time you see a new patient. So you see a new patient, you place orders immediately, you run your board and you kind of repeat that pattern and that makes you the most efficient. As ER providers, we have a lot of interruptions, and so interruption management is a big thing that he talks about. You know, we're constantly getting interrupted, whether an ambulance is arriving or a new patient gets roomed. Um, we're being asked for pain medication orders and antiemetic orders, and we're getting called by consultants. We're putting out calls to consultants. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things that we have to manage and part of being an effective ER provider is managing these efficiently. Multitasking is really a myth. You can't multitask effectively. You know, you're going to do everything poorly if you think you can multitask. And so what you really have to learn to do is do everything quickly in a series. And a lot of times if I get interrupted to do a task, I either do it right away or Ruben Strayer even recommends just setting a quick little task or writing it down on a piece of paper, some little reminder so that you know you need to get back and do that task. I typically just stop whatever I'm doing, put it in immediately, or I just give a verbal order for whatever it is to get done if I'm in the middle of something important that it's going to take me some time to get out of. But the more of those interruptions you get, you're going to end up taking longer to do whatever task you were doing. It takes a long time to stop what you're doing, do something else and come back to it than if you just finish what you're doing and then go do the new task. And so sometimes it is more effective just write something down or uh, make a list of things you need to do and finish the task at hand rather than just getting interrupted. Another big point he makes is kind of when you start your HPI with a patient is to start with broad-based questions and give the patient the opportunity to kind of tell you what's going on. And then you kind of narrow your questions down as you get into the review of systems because what the patient comes in complaining of is different than what the patient endorses. What the patient complains of is what brought them into the ER, it's what they're telling you, and what they endorse is kind of the answers to the yes and no questions that you have. Another really big point that he has is when 
The history and the physical exam are very limited, like in a patient that can't talk to you or you don't know why they came in. You need to expand the workup rather than narrow it down. You need to look for bigger differentials. You need to obtain more imaging and more lab work rather than less. And that's actually something I kind of struggled with when I was new. I thought you would order less if you can't get much information from the patient, but really that should be an indication that you need to expand your workup. Also, forget about these wastebasket diagnoses, the ones that we really aren't equipped to even make in the ER, like costochondritis, gastroenteritis, GERD, migraines, anxiety. These are diagnoses that we really can't make in the ER anyway, and so don't get caught up trying to make these diagnoses and just make sure the patient's safe to go home. That's really our job, is not to diagnose necessarily what's going on, but to make sure they're actually safe to be discharged home. And the last point he makes is to follow key cases. Now hopefully, whatever system you're in, you've got the ability to do this, like flag the chart, or have your clinical education department kind of follow up on these patients. But patients you're worried about real pathology and or weren't sure what was going on, it's really important to follow those so you can actually use it as a learning opportunity. Otherwise, you don't really know what ended up happening with that patient and you can't use it to better yourself in the future. And that's something I need to get better at in the ER is just following some of these patients that we admit and I'm not sure what's going on or they're really sick. Um, just to see what the hospitalist decides to do, what the ICU doc does and kind of follow their progression. Thank you so much guys for checking out this episode. I really hope you're finding this content valuable. If you do, please subscribe, like, comment, um, check out the website, check out the YouTube videos. Um, the more you guys can kind of interact with this content, the more I have the ability to create it. And again, thank you to Ruben Strayer for allowing me to use his content. Please check out his website. It's emupdates.com. He's got great information on there um, in regards to emergency medicine. Um, and you can check out his original video as well. And guys, remember that there are very few professions where you have the opportunity to save lives. So make sure when you're going out there that you're always ready for that opportunity. It doesn't come every day, but when it comes, you need to be ready. So thanks for watching, guys. Mm -hmm.